At first glance, the clock hanging on your wall might not seem special, but you'll be surprised to learn just how complex this tiny machine really is. Let's explore how a clock really works. First, the clock hands are driven by an intricate mechanism called the clock movement, hidden just behind the clock face. This is where the magic of precise timekeeping happens. Inside the clock movement, we'll find a series of gear wheels. These gears maintain the precise ratios needed to move each clock hand at exactly the right speed. They're driven by a special Levette-type stepping motor, which is key to keeping everything perfectly in sync. Stick around till the end, and I'll explain how this motor ensures precise timekeeping. But first, let's take a closer look at how the gear system works. First, a 12-toothed gear, directly connected to the motor, rotates in 180-degree steps every second, completing 30 turns per minute. This gear drives a 48-toothed gear. Let's calculate the RPM of the second gear. It rotates at 7.5 turns per minute. Interestingly, this second wheel is a compound gear, with a smaller 8-toothed gear attached, which also rotates 7.5 times per minute. This smaller 8-toothed gear drives another 60-toothed gear. If we calculate its RPM, we find that it completes one full rotation per minute. The second hand is connected to this gear, allowing it to tick precisely every second. This 60-toothed gear is also a compound gear, with a smaller eight-toothed gear attached that rotates once per minute. The minute and hour hands are geared down in a similar way. Altogether, seven gears work in harmony to keep the clock running smoothly. Now let's dive into the motor that powers all these mechanisms, the Levette-type stepping motor. This unique single-phase motor is commonly used in electromechanical clocks, though Levette's design has inspired many variations beyond clocks. Here's how it works. Like any motor, the Levette-type motor has two main parts, a stator and a rotor. The rotor is a round magnet attached to a gear wheel like this. The stator consists of a wire coil wound around a metal piece. The coil receives an alternating current pulse every second from the circuit. When powered, the metal piece becomes magnetic. As the current alternates, the magnetic poles switch as well. When the rotor is placed in the middle of the stator, it aligns its poles with the magnetic field. With the alternating magnetic poles, the rotor can align with two positions. Let's call them A and B. But how do we ensure the rotor always rotates in the same direction rather than just oscillating back and forth? The key lies in the clever design of the stator's geometry. Made from ferromagnetic metal, the stator naturally attracts the rotor's magnetic poles even when the coil isn't energized. If you look closely at the stator's shape around the rotor magnet, you'll notice it's uneven. This uneven shape causes the rotor to rotate slightly, aligning itself to minimize the distance between its magnetic poles and the stator. There are two such stable positions. These new positions, which we can call C and D, are slightly offset from the earlier A and B positions. If you try to change the rotor's angle, it will always return to one of these rest positions as soon as the force is removed. Now, let's try to explain the rotation. Here we have not energized the coil, and hence the rotor is resting at position D. But when we energize the coil like this, the magnetic field created by the coil moves the rotor to position A. 
Due to the initial offset, it will move to the position A via the anti-clockwise rotation. And when after energization of the stator has declined, now the stator is just a piece of iron, so the rotor moves further until it meets the rest point C. Again, we are energizing the coil from opposite polarity, same as earlier. Due to the initial offset, it will move to the position B via the anti-clockwise rotation. Again, after energization of the stator has declined, the stator is just a piece of iron, so the rotor moves further until it meets the rest point D. Now the motor has completed the one rotation anti-clockwise. We can repeat this process and make sure the motor always rotates in one direction. You may notice that the coil doesn't need to be continuously powered. It only requires two small pulses for each cycle, which significantly extends the battery life. But how are these precisely timed pulses created? That's what we're going to explore next. If you look closely at the clock circuit, you'll notice a small cylinder-shaped component. This is the crystal oscillator. A crystal oscillator is responsible for timekeeping in the clock. It works similarly to a tuning fork. When you strike a tuning fork, it vibrates at a specific, constant frequency, regardless of how hard it's struck. Since this frequency is within our hearing range, we can hear it. However, the vibration eventually fades away. To keep it vibrating continuously, you'd need to strike it repeatedly at the same frequency. As I mentioned earlier, the vibration of a tuning fork has a constant frequency, meaning each cycle takes the same amount of time. We can adjust the duration of each cycle by changing the length of the fork's prongs. If we could generate an electrical pulse with each vibration cycle, we'd have a perfect timekeeping signal for a clock. But how can we get an electrical pulse from a tuning fork? We can solve this problem using piezoelectric materials. Piezoelectric materials can generate electrical pulses when they are bent. If we oscillate a piezoelectric strip, it produces electrical pulses with a constant frequency, but these pulses fade away over time. Not only that, when an external voltage is applied to piezoelectric materials, they change shape. So, we can fabricate piezoelectric strips to bend like this when voltage is applied. Inside an oscillator, there is a piezoelectric strip shaped like a tuning fork. It is wrapped with two conductors. When we connect a battery to these terminals, the piezoelectric material bends. As soon as we remove the power, the material starts to oscillate, generating electrical pulses with a constant frequency. However, these pulses fade over time. To maintain continuous pulses, we need to turn the power on and off at the same frequency, much like striking a tuning fork repeatedly with a hammer. Manually controlling this is impractical, so instead, we use the electrical signal generated by the oscillator to drive the switch. This is done through an amplifier, which boosts the oscillator's signal. As a result, we get a continuous, constant-frequency electrical clock signal, ideal for precise timekeeping. But due to size and fabrication limitations, the frequency of a crystal oscillator starts in the kilohertz range. In clocks, we typically use a 32.768 kilohertz oscillator, meaning it produces exactly 32,768 oscillations every second. This number is significant because it equals to the 15th power of 2. Why is this important? This involves a bit of digital electronics, but don't worry, I'll keep it simple. We use D flip-flop circuits to count the number of cycles generated by the oscillator. If we send the oscillator's pulse into a D flip-flop, the output will show a pulse at half the frequency of the input signal. The time it takes to complete one cycle has doubled, meaning the frequency is halved. 
Now, if we take the output of the first flip-flop and feed it into another, it will again have the frequency. This process repeats, with each flip-flop cutting the frequency in half. In a clock circuit, we use 15 flip-flops in sequence, and by the 15th flip-flop, we get a clock pulse with a frequency of exactly 1 hertz, one pulse per second. This is how the high-frequency oscillator is scaled down to a precise one-second pulse for timekeeping. Let's summarize all these systems. The crystal oscillator generates a precise 32,768 Hz electrical signal. The counter circuit, made of flip-flops, reduces this signal to a 1 Hz square wave. The motor drive uses the 1 Hz pulse to control the Levette-type stepper motor, providing the alternating pulses required for its movement. Finally, the motor spins, keeping the clock's hands moving precisely. The timing of the motor's rotation is entirely dependent on the signal generated by the oscillator, which is the beating heart of the clock. This whole system, flip-flop counter, motor drive, and oscillator feedback, is integrated into a single circuit ensuring precise timekeeping. And that's how a clock works. Even though it might seem like a simple device, there are many complex mechanisms working together to keep everything running smoothly. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. That's all for today. If you think my contents are valuable to the world, you are welcome to join my Patreon community. Like and subscribe to Professor Mad for more interesting videos.